Basketball fans, welcome into Raptors today. The season is over, and with that comes the locker clean out final assessments of the year from the players. Akeel Augustine, joined by Sherm Hamilton, Paul Jones. We'll get their insights in a moment, but right now, the moment belongs to the Toronto Raptors, and we start with the man in the middle, Scotty Barnes. Scotty, what's it been like this last month or so having to watch not being able to play? How frustrating, I guess, has it been? And, and was there what were your expectations in terms of like, did you think that you'd be able to come back before the end of the season? Uh, I would say it wasn't really frustrating. Uh, it was a freak accident and, you know, you know, God got a plan for me. Uh, but this last month that I've been hurt these last 20, 20 games or so, you know, it's been the only thing that's been frustrating, you know, watching us lose and not being able to be out there on the floor with the guys. To try to help us win, but you know, I won't. I I don't take it for granted. Um, you know, I'm still blessed, and I view it as just being able to grow um, as a leader. Uh, just being every day sitting next to Garrett Temple, picking out his mind, um, watching the way he handles things, and he gets out there on the floor and plays so hard and so passionate. Uh, for me, just sitting back and watching that, um, you know, I just can't wait to get back on that the floor and play my heart out. Uh, just seeing the type of vet he is and how he just doesn't take things for granted, uh, you know, that helps me. Uh, so every time we got a huddle, um, every time at halftime we talk, every time our team has something, you know, it just helps me. Growing to that leadership role, so comfortable, uh, not being able to have to think about it. You know, when team meetings, and you know, I used to have to think about things to say. It just all just comes so natural to me. Just watching him do it, um, everything just comes so natural to me. Uh, every time out, you see me cheering. I'm hyping the guys up, I'm telling these guys things that I see from my po my point of view. Not being out there on the floor, trying to help them out. In any single way I can, uh, just being that vocal leader, uh, it help it helps a lot. Um, not being out there on the floor, you know, it hurts. Um, so it's like, okay, I'm not out there on the floor to play with those guys. It's like, okay, like what am I supposed to say? But no, it just makes it. It's just so easy and so natural. I'm comfortable doing it, telling them my perspective and try try to give them ways that. They can help their game out there on the floor as well. There you heard Scotty Barnes. The big takeaway for me was honestly just taking a look at his hand. I mean, some people thought he could have come back sooner, but that hand was swollen and looked like – I'm not sure I've seen an injury like that to a player's hand, so you know that it was serious. But thankfully, um, he seems to be in great spirits. First off, we'll talk about the maturity that he's shown. Jones, you mentioned, you know, that's the most talkative I've ever seen Scotty Barnes in a media setting. It's, it's interesting um... – what happens when you are you are allowed to, have to, or maybe forced to sit back and watch. And uh, you could watch Scotty's uh, demeanor, his deportment on the bench. The and his outfits. The interactions, yeah, the outfits too. <laughs> the interactions with teammates on the bench, with the coaching staff, and with the teammates on the floor. There were questions. Uh, there were admonitions there were there were all kinds of you know a huge range of reactions from Scotty because he's sitting there in a situation where he's never been and he's trying to take it all in learning you heard him talk about you know sitting beside a vet Garrett Temple sitting beside an old guy in class and saying hey what's happening here what's happening there so it, it's never ideal to be missing games but if he's getting something out of it in that regard where he can bring it back next year, Sherman be better. And we've seen guys and sometimes it's a cliche. Oh yeah. You get to sit and watch from the bench, but at this age, as young as he is in his NBA career, it may be a real benefit to him. Well, and learning I feel happens in so many different ways. People learn differently. And I think Scotty on the floor, we saw him be able to absorb, make mistakes correct it on the fly his learning curve was very steep when he played and I think this type of learning is different because it gives you a, t a chance to assess not only your position in the situation but the other four guys on your team in situations and it gives you a chance to understand from sitting beside a guy like Garrett Temple 
maybe perspectives that you weren't able to really mm-hmm. see on your own. And that type of information is valuable as he goes into a summer where he's going to be asked to do a lot moving forward. So I just think that Scotty's growth has been great to this point, but sometimes, you know, it's a blessing when you have an injury and it's not like a major injury that's going to affect you for the rest of your career, but it's an injury that you can get over fairly quickly, but it's forced you to just pause yeah, and just assess. Now, a lot of the conversation in this season prior to the trades is, okay, is Scotty that guy, right? And the trades were made. He's been given that license. Sherm, your impression of how he handled being the top dog, the face of a franchise, as Darko said at one point in the season, the face of the league. Uh, how did he respond, and how should Raptors fans feel moving forward knowing that he's the key cog? Well, I think uh, he's been challenged, and I think he's answered the call as a young player. We look at his skill set, and we understand that he has the talent potential to be a very dominant player. He's shown the work ethic. He's shown the the understanding and the ability to learn. He's got all, I think, the tenets of a player that can be an elite player in this league. Now it's just about putting the work in and continuing to grow. And the franchise has made it clear they are going to invest in him as yeah. that guy. Yeah. So now he just has to match that intensity and match that challenge. And all of a sudden now you have two sides working and pulling in the same direction. But I think there's no question. Scotty, from a skill set perspective, he is the guy. He will be the focal piece because he can impact the game on so many levels. I, I think the key word that Sherm, Sherm mentioned there is grow. Like, he, he can – it only happens – in fits and starts, you can only grow so much at a time. If if you know if the end goal is a kilometer away, you're not getting a kilometer all at once. The journey of a thousand miles starts with, with the, the first, first step. step. And and right now, his capacity for growth has a limitation. Once he gets to that spot and he's got that covered, now it's time to move to the next step. And and with Sherm talking about his skills. That's not an issue. He'll continue to work on them, refine them. They will get better, but they'll get better and look better in the context of all the other growth, right? And and I, I go back to him saying, sitting beside Garrett. Garrett doesn't have the same skill set as Scotty, so he's pointing out things to Scotty that maybe Scotty didn't think about, right? You can't throw that pass to that guy because he... Oh, why not? He can't just jump up there and get it like me. No, he can't. You have to be aware of his limitations, the defense, all of these other things. The nuances of the game. That that sometimes when you it just comes naturally and instinctually and, and you see it that other people don't, that's to me that's where some of the learning comes in, right? So he's taking steps. He's going to get to another spot. It's like, okay, now we can take another step. You can't take the two or three steps in one shot. Ladies and gentlemen, time for R.J. Barrett. Just going off numbers, let's just say, like your, your season, high, season, our career best in terms of efficiency and shooting percentages and all these kinds of things here in Toronto. And how do you explain it? Like what, what went so well just in terms of that for you? I just think I'm a good fit here. You know, I think that's the biggest thing, just – um, the way I play, the way I've always played, it, it works very well with Darko's system and and just also just the players that we have here. And, I mean, could you elaborate a little bit on, on what about why the fit is good for mm-hmm. your skill set? Uh, just you know, I, I like to I like to run, I like to play, I like to be free. That's you know that that's me. I'm I'm good with just uh, playing free and and making reads and just. You know, the whole team just sharing the ball and everybody. That's just my – that's kind of my game. I, I don't think I'm a – I don't think I'm a, you know, selfish player, but I think I just like to get up and down, run, and try to just win basketball games. All right, so the obvious story with RJ this year was there were certain limitations, parameters, expectations put on him in New York under Coach Tibbs, playing in the corner a lot, limited opportunity. He comes to Toronto and kind of reignites the interest and some of the potential that people saw in him as a high draft pick. Sherm, I'll start with you. When you look at RJ's game, did you think he was the same type of player in New York that he is in Toronto, or did something happen? A lot happened. I mean, he got into a system as he, he, you know, he's very clear about 
that allowed movement, that allowed ball movement, that allowed him to engage and start the process sometimes on the floor. And and RJ, I mean, players want opportunities. Even as good as RJ is, in New York, I don't think he felt, and I don't believe he had the opportunities to really show who he was. He had flashes where he'd make plays, but it wouldn't be a consistent dose of it. Here in Toronto, he's getting the opportunity to handle the ball, to play pick and roll, to run, to move off the ball, and just knowing that it's going to result in something. And that's a freeing feeling for a player. And, and RJ's really taken advantage of that. You look at his numbers. I mean, 20 of his 32 games, he scored 20 points or more. Mm-hmm. So he's consistently scoring. And that field goal percentage, and it's it's I think it's around 40% from three, 39% from three, they weren't close to that in New York. So RJ is taking advantage of an opportunity, but there's something that allows a player to just be themselves when they feel like they fit and they're in a situation that works for their style, and that's what Toronto has been for RJ Barrett. Yeah. It was interesting that the word reset was mentioned there, and what we are seeing from RJ Barrett now, for those people that haven't watched and are surprised, you shouldn't be. I mean, this is what he has done before, It's what he's capable of doing, and that part was interrupted when he went to New York. And the other part of that, the other side of that is you play under those constraints or in that limited role, it also puts a little bit of pressure on you, right? Like, I I got the ball here. I better do something with it because I don't know when I'm going to get it again. And... You step outside of yourself. You you maybe force things. You you maybe in your head you're thinking, I gotta do something, I have to produce. And I, I just think he was freed when he came to Toronto. So the idea of a reset is is terrific in that we're seeing what he's always done, save for the time in New York, and now he's doing it again. And hopefully he can take that forward in Toronto and improve on it and improve the skills I have no issues with the decision-making with a young team as one of the young, quote, leaders, unquote, that is going to be highly responsible and around what's going Scotty on. And play a lot more. Bingo. Bingo. And I'd say this. I mean, you know, the idea of what RJ did in Toronto, I don't think people expected. However, now that they've seen it, there will be expectations coming into next season. The great thing that I've seen about RJ is That's not every problem. level he's gone to, yep. he's met. And superseded expectations. Yeah. Montverde, Duke, hundred percent. So there's no, the national team. You talk about all the junior, all the stuff he's done. He's exceeded expectations. So I think now with this new bar set, I think there's no question he's going to step up to that challenge, and he's going to be a very successful. We talk about the excitement around looking at the young core. Imagine the excitement within a guy like R.J. Barrett, thinking like, okay, I was able to do this. We need more. I'm capable of doing more. I got something to show you. Bodes well for the national team, too, for him to come out such a strong yes. year, knowing he's a big part of that moving forward. Welcome back to Raptors today. As promised, the point guard for the future of the Toronto Raptors, pending on contract situation. Here is Emmanuel quickly. One of the things that you, you said you wanted to show when you got here was that you're a lead guard in this league, that you're more than just a scorer, you're a playmaker, uh, among other things, obviously. And, and, are you happy with what you've been able to show in, I think it's 38 games, and with a full summer in this system and a full training camp, how much more do you think you can show next year? Yeah, I'd say, um, say uh, I guess happy, but, you know, there's always room for improvement, I think. Uh, you always want to sit back and, you know, kind of be your own cheerleader a little bit, but at the same time, understand that there's a lot of work to be done and there's always room to improve. Uh, but yeah, looking at the summer, you know, there's there's also a lot of work to do, you know, com- this coming summer, and uh, I think I'm willing to do that. Well, actually, I know I'm willing to do that, so I'm looking forward to that, um, and also just doing it with a group of guys that enjoy doing the work as well, because uh, the work's not easy. Uh, but um, you know, when you have guys that are willing to sacrifice their time, sacrifice uh, other things and things like that, you know, you have a chance to to do something great. Also, an important summer. For you from a business standpoint going into free agency what are, are some of the things that you're looking for and prioritizing in that process and would staying here long term be something that's that, that you want to do 
Absolutely love Toronto. Uh, since the day I got here, uh, they've done nothing but uh, show me love. Love is an action word. Uh, it's not just something you just throw around. And uh, they've done that from the the day I've got here to to today. So um, obviously the team and my agent have to handle everything, but um, I love being here in Toronto. Absolutely. Emmanuel quickly coming off a strong showing in audition for the Toronto Raptors as the starting point guard. Could you have asked for more coming out of that trade and at that position, looking at the numbers that this young man has posted, uh, Jonesy? Are the Raptors not in the perfect position if they can lock him down long term? Well, to your question, considering what he was doing in New York and yeah. the role they had him in, uh, I give Toronto management great, uh, you know, I give them credit for having great foresight and vision as to what he could be and growing into that potential. Um, it's a steal. That's he's like, been he's been great. I mean, you talk to people. Trade's a steal. No, but were, both franchises benefited. Yeah, from it's this one trade. of those where both. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, Like I, I mean, I think about it, and I know people in New York were saying, "Well, he's he's a straight two guard man. He comes off the bench, he lights it up." I'm like, hold on a second. That's what they want him to do. That doesn't mean he can't do more. But that's also the profile of modern point guards well, nowadays. Uh, w- w- they're not, in my sense, they're not quote point guards. Yeah, they're. Guards. They're guards. They're lead guards. They're scoring guards. And, and in a sense, it goes back to, I, I go back to the bad boy Pistons. Who was the point guard? Was it Joe or was it Isaiah? They kind of did the same thing when they needed to. I mean, Isaiah was established as the point guard, but Joe would take the ball. Joe would be a playmaker. I mean, so I, I just like the fact that his versatility is coming through, right? He's, he's, he's running a team. He's scoring. And, and he's might, making other people better as well. And it might be the perfect complementary situation because we talked about Point Scotty and we look around the league and different players are playing that point guard position. So this may be the, a marriage that's like perfect for this Raptors team. Yeah, and then like you're you're pointing out, Scotty handles the ball, Emmanuel can play off the ball, and he can score. And I think sometimes when you see a player in a system like you saw Emmanuel in New York, because he came off the bench and he was scoring the basketball, you see his numbers shooting that for, for almost 40% from three is crucial because he can pull up off the dribble as well. But you see him and you say, well, he gets to Toronto and he was scoring when trying to score when he got here. And you could see there was a conversation between him and Darko and he was challenged to say, hey, we want to see you be more of a playmaker. We know you can score. But can you set the table for your teammates? And we saw him have some gaudy assist totals for a while, 12 assists, 10 assists per game. And to me, that to me showed me that not only is he a player, but he's a guy who can accept instruction, can accept a challenge, and go out there and execute. And now we're looking at the balance of a scoring guard who knows how to set people up, Right. and now he becomes a point guard. And that, to me elevates not only the Raptors, but it elevates Emmanuel quickly in terms of what he can become as a true lead point guard. It, it, it makes his scoring more dangerous. And w- it's always been said, I'm not always afraid of the guy who's going to give me 30. Just be wary of that guy who's given me, he's given you 20, and he's got 13 assists. Because now you got, you, 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 the whole party's going. You you got a whole party to, to worry about, not just one guy. And I think... As Sherm said, when quickly scoring, now he's setting other people up. His scoring becomes that more, much more valuable, and you've got a whole bunch of other people at the table. Up next is the money. The Raptors have to lock this young man up, in my humble opinion. I think they're going to. 100 mil plus looks like the expectation. And in all likelihood, Raptors, they're going to get their man in free agency, I personally think, Jonesy. Yeah, I, I mean, you made the trade to have yeah. the young core. That was, again, I go back to where I started with part of the vision. Looking ahead, what can this kid be? We see this potential. Imagine putting him together with these other pieces. Now you have to go out and execute and sign him. Yeah, and you think about, you know, the vision was now and down the road when they got RJ and Emmanuel. And you think about Emmanuel, well, he fits a profile of something the Raptors, from a point guard perspective, hasn't really had in terms of his speed. He's got all NBA speed when it comes to with the ball in his hands. And the balance of that plus his age, plus the experience, plus the opportunity, plus the core group, it all makes sense. And you know that the Raptors management put that all into the bowl and mixed it up and said, that's the guy we want. 
Okay, that's it for this segment. Still more to come here on Raptors Today. Producer Jake, where are we going next? Jakob Pertle on the side of the break. I feel all right. Uh, the recovery's been been going pretty well, but at the same time, it's it's definitely been like a little bit of a, a frustrating process for me. Just, I mean, if I just look back at like whatever happened for me this season since January, like I, I barely played any games. Like there was first one injury, then like um, it was looking well. Like uh, I think we were we were looking good as a team and then like going down with the second injury for the rest of the season was a little bit frustrating and yeah um us not playing well during those times and then like just being stuck on the sidelines was a little bit frustrating but now overall like i'm i'm feeling good uh like i said the the recovery process is going well so i'm just i'm just happy about that Jakob Pertl was a very divisive move, uh, according to the Raptors fan base, but this is a quality center that a lot of people are excited about moving forward, but not the year he wanted. He openly said he was frustrated. The in Two different injuries, it really cost him time. Sherm, I'll start with you moving forward. Jakob's going to be good for this group, I feel, simply because of the kind of space he takes up, but your impressions of how this group collectively looks moving forward with JP at center. Yeah, I think Jakob is a stabilizer. You know, from a defensive perspective, you know he's going to play back there. He's going to block. He's going to alter shots. He's going to be in position. He's going to communicate all the things you need for the back line of your defense. Offensively, Jakob does a great job in terms of being in the right spot. He slides into space. He's got that little push shot that he can knock down. But he can set good screens. He can roll. He can roll short. He can roll long. And he's a playmaker. He can make a play. He, that ball's kicked to him. He can get it to the other side of the floor, going to a DHO. He's got a lot of skills that really help stabilize the center spot. And I really like the contrast with he and Kelly at that, that center was, that, spot. Yeah, that was actually my and, next And question. to me, that, you know, you can game plan for him on the floor, and then here comes Kelly, and he's got a whole different style of basketball. So I like the contrast of the two bigs right now. The, the two of them make up really a, a big that you – an ideal big, right, in terms of having the stretch component with Kelly and – um, to Sherm's point about about Pirtle offensively, he just always seems to be in the right spot, right? He's he, and he has. I think he's got really good hands too. He catches a lot of stuff that is you know is shoveled to him or or, or passed to him in, in sometimes difficult situations. And he's a terrific rebounder. Like the Raptors had their issues uh, with all the injuries rebounding at the end of the year, and Pirtle. I mean. He, he, you you watch there are games where he's just halftime. He's got nine rebounds. He's got ten rebounds at halftime. He's doing such a good job of just anticipating being in the right spots and the offensive rebounding too, keeping the ball alive, finishing around the basket after drives and penetration. So he's a great compliment, and he's a guy that probably doesn't get as much praise as he should with all of the other noisy pieces on the floor. Uh, but he's a he's a real he's a real glue piece to their offense and the defense too. Yeah, one area of growth obviously for fans is the free throw shooting, but that just comes with time, and hopefully the whole team, because that was kind of a sore spot for this Raptors group, continues to grow in that direction. That does it for episode one from the end of season locker cleanout. Still, we got two more episodes for you, episodes two and three still to come. So we'll see you guys next time. Deuces. Deuces.